So in the last class we were discussing the true nature of the ultimate reality, which is all-pervading, pure, which cannot be defined or explained, and which transcends the time and changes. As I said earlier, the verses 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th deal with the idea contained in the first line of the first verse of this Upanishad, Isha Vasim Vidabhisarvam, a description of the absolute reality in the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th verses. So this is the last verse of that particular category. Saparega shukram akayam avranam asnaviram shuddham apapavidham kavihi manishihi paribhuhu soyambhuhu yatha tathidorthan vidadhan shashuti pheha samapheha. It is this absolute reality which is all pervasive, all pervading, omniscient, omnipresent which is beyond definition and descriptions and words and sensory perception, which is the source of the creation and which guides the creation and different beings living in this world in their respective activities. The, the essence of these four slokas can be summed up in a few words, in a few sentences rather. It says that the absolute reality is beyond maya. Now, maya means limitation or relativity. Maya means limitation or real relativity. It's a simple word, ma and ya. In Sanskrit, ma indicates negation. In Sanskrit grammar, those who know Sanskrit grammar will understand. When you want to tell somebody, don't come here, it means ma agacha. Or don't speak ma vadatu. So, it you can something like a command. You tell somebody, don't come here, don't do, don't speak like that. It's a kind of negation. So, ma, that means that which implies absence of anything. And ya is a pronoun. Now, you don't use a pronoun he, she, this or that. You don't these terms. You don't use these terms unless there is something which is indicated by these pronouns. So, ya implies that there is something which we pursue, which is in front of us, which we pursue either by seeing, by hearing, by touching or by smelling or mentally uh, cognizing. So that's, the, that's what is implied by ya. And ma means the absence of anything. Now how do you combine this? It's a very, very metaphysical, highly metaphysical idea. Vivekananda says, maya is the only word which can explain the world in which we are living and the life that we are living living in this world. We can't say the world doesn't exist in an absolute sense because we are living this world, we are part of this world, we are walking, we are eating, we are breathing, everything we do in this world. And we are, and the world is something that we experience in, a, in everyday life of which we are a part, in which we live, which we pursue. So you can't say the world doesn't exist at all. We can't, ex we can't say that the world does not exist at all. In an absolute sense. At the same time, we can't say that the world does exist in an absolute sense. As I said last time, if you want to use the word capital letter, the re re reality, using the capital letter R, reality, then that reality should be a changeless reality if you want to use 
that word reality in an absolute sense. Use the word, if you want to use the word capital letter R. Now that reality should be changeless. It should be the same in the past, in the present, and in the future. Now there is nothing in this world which is changeless, which is real in an absolute sense. As I said some time back, the earth itself came into existence, if you believe in Big Bang Theory, uh, more than 13 billion years back, and may exist perhaps about 3 billion years more. That means the, the longevity of Earth is something like 16 point or billion years. Before that, the world did not exist. And after 3 billion years, it won't exist. So it also is limited in time. It also comes into, comes into existence in time. It exists in time and will vanish sometime in the future. So it is not changeless. It is changing. So it is not real in an absolute sense. It is real only in a relative sense. And it is Maya. It is not absolute non-existence and it is not absolute existence either. Swami Vivekananda explained this Maya. It's neither existence nor non-existence, neither with parts nor without parts, and so on. And it is nothing but an English translation of the definition given by Shankaracharya. Sanna pya sanna pya bhayat migano, bhinna pya bhinna pya bhayat migano, sangha pya sangha pya bhayat migano. Last word is Mahat Buddha Anirvachani Yaruba. I mean, it, it is one, it is. In the, it is a great wonder and it is beyond description. This is precisely what Swamiji says. Maya is a statement of fact. means it is something of which we are a part when we live in this world that we can't deny. But at the same time, it is not absolutely real. Because it comes into existence sometime in the past. Continues to exist for some time, in, which we call present and vanishes some time in the past, sorry, in the future. Just as a pot made of clay comes into existence when the pot maker makes it, not before, it, before that it did exist. And it exists for some time and will vanish, go, it will go back to, into clay. So this is what is meant by saying that the world is maya, world is relative. Neither existence in the absolute sense, nor existence in the relative sense. Sorry, nor existence, neither existence in the absolute sense, nor non-existence in the absolute sense. It is something we experience. So it is not absolute non-existence. But we know that it, it, it is limited by time. So it is not absolute existence. So, this is in the technical language. There are terms jayade, asti, vardhade, viparinamade, kshiyade, nasiri. I won't go into those details. Another very important criterion by which we judge something, whether it's real or not, is a perception in the three states of experiences. That means waking, dream, and dreamless state experiences. When we... When we are living in the waking state, we perceive things with the mind and senses of perception. When we dream, we recreate these things, but senses are not involved. In dream, we see things. We may be walking through the streets of San Francisco. It may be broad sun, sunlight's there everywhere. We can see things, but we are sleeping in a dark room, it is pitch darkness everywhere. Our eyes are closed, but we see things. So the mind projects these experiences. In waking state, we experience these impressions are stored up in our mind. In dream state, we project these impressions mentally at the purely mental level. Senses are not involved. 
eyes are closed, so we, we can't see physically, but mentally we see. And in dreamless sleep state, we don't see anything, we don't perceive anything. It is called a causal state. But after returning into waking state from dreamless state, state we we understand we had a wonderful, blissful experience, but we don't experience that bliss when we are experiencing it in dreamless state. So, there is a change. In waking state, we walk with our legs and we see with our eyes. Of course, we perceive with our mind. In dream, we create or rather recreate things purely at the mental level. Senses are not involved. We cannot, we are not walking and we are not seeing physically. So there is a change and in dreamless sleep state, there is no perception at all. So there is a change. Now anything which changes in the three states of experience is relative. It cannot be absent. And anything which comes into existence sometime in the past, exists for some time which we call the present, and vanishes some time in the future, also cannot be absolute. It is called the relative. Now, Vedanta calls this world is relative. The eighth verse that we dealt with last time concludes that the absolute reality, Atman, is not relative. It is absolute. So these terms are used, the Sanskrit terms are used. Pariga, Shukram, Akayam, Avranam, Asnaviram, Shuddham, Apapavidham, Kavihi, Manishihi, Paripuhu, Soyampuhu, all these terms are used to indicate the, f the fact that the absolute reality never comes into existence in the past because there was never a time when it did not exist. And never vanishes in the future because there would never be a time when it would not exist. And again, it is the ever-present witness in Sanskrit called Sakshi. Present in the waking, in the dream, and also in the dreamless state. So, this, has, this part of Vedanta philosophy has been expounded in the eighth verse. Now we are entering another phase of specula philo philosophical speculation in this ninth verse. As I said earlier, the fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth deal with the absolutistic ideal of Atman and the ninth, from ninth verse onwards, from nine to fourteenth verse, there is an elaborate exposition of the idea of reconciliation uh, and synthesis of action and knowledge, action and meditation. That's the subject discussed in these verses from nine to fourteen. Because we are to deal with the fourteenth. Sorry, the ninth verse. Antham tama pravishendi ye avidyam upasade tato bhuya iva te tamo ya u vidyayam ritaha. This is the mantra, the verse. Ye avidyam upasade. I am just giving for the convenience of those who are interested the prose order. This is a metrical form. This Upanishad. As I said in the beginning, there are two types of Upanishads those which are in metrical form and those which are in prose form. And there are a few which combine both the metrical and also the prose characteristics. So I'm just giving the prose order for those who are interested. Ye avidyam upasate te tamaha pravishanti ye u vidyayam rataha te Tataha bhuyaha iva tamaha pravishanti. This is the prose order. Now we will come to the subjects. Here you find 
a few important terms are used which are highly technical and which need special attention and interpretation two words that you have to notice avidya and vidya in the ordinary language or linguistic tradition avidya implies ignorance lang- absence of vidya which means ignorance and vidya implies the word vidya implies knowledge or wisdom here avidya means the word avidya means not only ignorance but also a kind of static piety or mechanical ritualism in ancient times there was school of thought there were the school of ritualists they used to believe that if you go on performing rituals mechanically you can reach the ultimate goal of spiritual life they were called the mimamsakas and the exponent of that philosophy original exponent was jaimini the exponent he also the teacher of the samaveda now they believe that you don't have to worry about the knowledge of atman the knowledge of the absolute reality if you go on performing mechanical rituals characterized by static piety mechanical piety that's the end of the spiritual journey if one goes on performing rituals in a temple or in any place of worship that work the action itself produces the ultimate result and there is nothing beyond that they did not believe in the existence of an absolute atman the reality which transcends the limitations of time and the limitations of perception during the three states of waking dreaming and dreamless sleep stage they did not believe in the concept of a reality they say is earlier the capital letter r which never originates because it always existed and it never vanishes because it will always exist they didn't believe in the concept of the absolute reality which transcends time and which transcends sensory perception they were they, they were the practitioners of a kind of mechanical ritualistic piety here avidya implies that school of philosophy and in modern times we can say people who go on working hard with a definite motive with zeal with a definite goal in their life i want to work hard i want to make money i want to earn status position and so on they are the worshipers of avidya they are the worshipers of anatman or called non self and the upanishad tells you that such people enter the world of darkness because they are the worshipers of the limited and the relative without knowing that there is something beyond this something beyond empirical something unlimited and infinite they don't they don't they do not know that thinking that the money the position the status that we earn in this life are everlasting it's a kind of spiritual blindness spiritual death spiritual suicide and they enter the world of darkness that's the literal meaning of this verse in fact they live in a world in a world of spiritual emptiness spiritual voidness that's why the upanishad says they enter the world of utter darkness blinding darkness spiritually they are blind there is no spiritual light for them the next verse can be sometimes be something can be misleading tato bhuya ivate tamu 
የኡቢዲያያም ረታሐ people who are devoted to to his wisdom to his vidya enter a world which is much more dark which is till darker that they again can lead to a lot of confusion the literal meaning is literal meaning of course only literal meaning and it is not the real meaning because these mantras these verses have been commented upon by a number of great philosophers and spiritual giants the literal meaning is those who follow the path of mechanical piety mechanical ritualism and those who think that whatever they can earn in this world in this world is everlasting the money state is position so on they enter the world of darkness they live in a world of ignorance and ignorance is simply is symbolic of darkness and those who follow the path of vidya the opposite of avidya enter a world which is still darker the meaning is this those who follow the the path of uh, vidya the implication is this this vidya is used in the sense the philosophical aspect of mechanical philosophy static piety mechanical piety that is those who believe that by thinking and studying and contemplating on the effects of rituals without doing any work enter a darker world their destiny is still much still more unfortunate that's the implication now coming to the subject the second word the second part should be explained further suppose a person thinking that mechanical actions mechanical rituals uh, will bring him everything will take him to ultimate goal and he goes on doing something physically is involved in many actions he goes on praying to different deities but all bec- all uh, for material gains if he goes to a temple or a place of worship he will pray for material benefits every action is guided by a strong desire for something purely empirical or materialistic that man can be corrected you can tell him well you are following the wrong path look around and see the plight of people the fate of those who have lived their life working all the time for material benefits you work on spend whole day whole life for making money and ultimately he may end up his life in a lunatic asylum or he may put an end to his own life anxiety neurosis anxiety neurosis depression schizophrenia split personality psychotic and neurotic problems this is the fate of those who spend their whole life for material pleasure for money status and material benefits they may spend all their time and energy for acquiring wealth but they won't have the psychological health to enjoy that wealth by the time they have accumulated wealth they are taken away from what they have got and the life ends in a in swami vivekananda's language in a wailing so and this we can see called problems of abundance the more wealth more industrialization the more money more status more suicides and more, and there, there are many more hospitals and uh, many and uh, and many and more and more cases of psychotic and neurotic problems they grow in direct proportion to the accumulation of wealth so that is implied by the first verse 
Now, the second verse tells you the fate of those who are slightly different. They don't do any work. They are convinced that there is something beyond work. What is that? They think placing or just theoretical understanding of spiritual philosophy is the end of one spiritual life. So, for example, in the commentators say, those who have got a strong uh, philosophical or intellectual conviction in Upanishad philosophy, without any practice of it, only intellectual conviction and no practice, they enter a much worse, their much worse world, much darker world, because they are convinced that they have reached the ultimate goal. Though you can, they cannot be corrected. They are strongly convinced that spirituality means intellectual conceitness or intellectual convictions. Others can be corrected. Those who follow the path of mechanical ritualism, those who follow the path of mechanical actions, can be corrected. We can tell them, See, there is something beyond all this. You can see what is happening to people who have followed the path, who have followed, who have pursued the path of mechanical or static piety. Their life ends in ruins. So we can correct them. But those who study the Upanishads and thinking and think that the Upanishads only teach you philosophy and nothing beyond that. There is no need to translate this philosophy into the really real life. They, their condition is much worse. You cannot correct them. Here I must tell you a very, very important characteristic, uh, the point of demarcation with Western philosophical tradition and Vedanta. In Vedanta, we have three criteria to judge the spiritual status of a teacher. Sruti, Yukti and Anubhuti, Swanabhuti. In Sanskrit it's called, in English we can say, the understanding of the fundamental doctrines of Vedanta and the ability to analyze these doctrines in the light of logic and reasoning. But that's not enough. Upanishads make a strong proclamation that the, the reality is beyond books, beyond philosophy, and beyond reasoning. And Shankaracharya, the Bhashagara says, Swanubhutya. So, Shrutya, Yuktya, Swanubhuti. Swanubhuti is one's own spiritual experience. So, the experience is the criterion of spiritual realization in Vedanta. It doesn't mean that we don't need philosophy. It doesn't mean. We need to study spiritual ideas, religious texts, Upanishad texts, no doubt, because from these texts we understand that the reality is beyond books. We need to study them, but we should not be misled to the wrong conclusion that Vedanta means so many books, known as Vedantic texts. Ultimately, Vedanta means one's own experience. In the, as I said some time back, in the Untaga Upanishad, there is an interesting dialogue. A great uh, ritualist, a very rich man, he approaches an ancient sage, Ankiras. Shaunaka is the name of that rich man, the famous, the, I mean, the prominent figure in society, the household. He approaches an ancient sage. His name is Ankiras. Then ask him, Adhihi Bhavo Brahmi, mean, please teach me the ultimate reality. And then he, uh, the question is put in this way, is there any science, any learning by knowing, by knowing which we can know about everything else? In reply to this question, the sage answers, See, there are two types of learning in this world. One, the relative, or the secondary, the transitory. 
and all the upanishads all the vedas all bibles all religious texts belong to this category but there is something beyond this that is experience so there are many who may conclude that vedanta means a philosophical system like kandian philosophy or utilitarian philosophy or empirical british empiricism or neoplatonism and so on there is a basic difference those who teach neoplatonism or critical pure reason or critical practical reason of kant may be called neoplatonists or kandians those who philip bentham's books uh, jays mills books may be called uh, utilitarians or empirical empiricists those who read teach and discuss a particular school of philosophy are known by these terms but the vedantin is not one who just studies vedanta philosophy the vedantin in the ultimate sense is one who experiences the ultimate goal of vedanta philosophy when is swa anubhuti means one's own inner experience is the ultimate criterion by which we judge the caliber of a teacher of vedanta or a practitioner of vedanta but at the same time a systematic and devoted study of vedantic texts are essential that's the first step we, without entering the first step we cannot go to the higher level without entering the kindergarten you cannot go to higher classes so here the the upanishads refer this particular verse ninth verse refers to those who think that they have studied upanishads and upanishads means a particular philosophy and there is nothing beyond that they completely neglect the experience dimension of upanishad philosophy such people can never be corrected because they are convinced that philosophical conviction is the goal of one's life so it leads to a kind of intellectual uh, conceitness mingled with spiritual blindness spiritual darkness that's why the, the ninth mantra tells us that those who follow the path of vidya that means those who follow or those who believe the vidya or brahma vidya means just intellectual conviction they enter a much darker world than those who know nothing about upanishads who mechanically follow rituals this is the implication of this particular verse then this <coughs> the next 10th verse is a continuation of the same idea anya devahur vidyaya anya dahu avidyaya idi susruma dhiranam e nastat vija chakshire if you split the word and put in prose order vidyaya here vidyaya here to those who want to study they have to add vidyaya phalam or vidyaya ka phalam they have to put anya teva the meaning is the result of vidya is distinct ahu mean do people say avidyaya phalam anyateva the result of avidya is still something different the result of avidya is different from the result of vidya ahu means people say see just proclaim ye naha tat vichachakshire dhirana dhirana means those intelligent wise men means possessive tesham dhirana iti susruma we have heard from great men that the result of vidya is different from the result of avidya the next two verses should be read together but we need a little philosophical discussion before entering the true implication of these two verses now you know in in ancient vedic philosophy there were broadly speaking there were three levels of uh 
philosophical speculation. Three phases in the evolution of philosophy. At the lowest level, they used to believe that if you go on performing mechanical rituals, called Vedic rituals, in today's terms, just blind mechanical uh, pursuit of empty rituals, we can reach the ultimate goal of spiritual life. Here I would tell you, mechanical ritualism is not altogether bad. But suppose a man thinks that going to a place of worship at a particular time is the end of spiritual life. Or mechanically following a rigid pattern, a regimented um, routine is the end of life. There is nothing beyond that. Then, that leads to spiritual blindness. In the beginning, we need to follow certain strong disciplines. Getting up at fixed time in the morning, performing certain religious rituals like reading sacred scriptures, doing jabba, we call taking the holy name, prayer. We have to fix a time, half an hour prayer, one hour prayer, meditation, and so on. This is very important for a beginner. And without uh, following this rigid pattern, no one can enter the threshold of the world of spiritual life. But this is only the beginning of spiritual life. That's an important point to remember. Otherwise, a man living in the army also follows a rigid pattern. He has to follow a fixed rules and regulations. So just rigidity of routine or mechanically follow certain uh, um, well-oriented, certain well-regulated patterns and rituals of life alone cannot take a man to the ultimate goal in spiritual life. But at the same time, we have to remember that it is very essential for any spiritual practitioner at the beginning to follow a well-regulated pattern of spiritual discipline. But the rigidity of discipline sometimes can take, give us the wrong notion. It can create the illusion that this regimentation itself is spirituality. There is nothing beyond that. In fact, at the highest spiritual experience, a man transcends all these rules and regulations. Because every minute becomes a matter of spiritual experience. Every act becomes an act of worship. Every thought becomes an act of meditation. So every minute of one's existence becomes living in the presence of God if you use the language of Brother Lawrence. This is the ultimate goal. But this sometimes is forgotten by the beginner. He thinks that mechanically if you follow certain patterns, don't worry about it, there is nothing beyond that. This is, this was, this is called Apara Bhakti. It, it's not Apara Bhakti, because Apara Bhakti includes secondary form of worship, devotion. It, 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 it should be accompanied by a sincere devotion. But this kind of mecha in mechanical uh, ritualism is devoid of any element of devotion. Blindly following certain rituals and practices without any attention anywhere. This is the ultimate goal of spiritual life according to one school of ancient Vedic philosophers. They were known as Mimamsakas. No, this is the big. This is the most primitive kind of religion. And I told you some time back in the Bhagavata Purana, there is a reference to those who belong to the kindergarten of spiritual life, Prakrta Bhakta. It is called. Archayam eva hariye pujam chasadhiye kade nacatad bhakti shu channe shu Sabhakta Prakrta. Prakrta sa udakrta. You find in the, if those who are interested in the Bhagavad, the 11th book, in the second chapter, you find 
the idea is very simple and it's very close to this uh, the, the Upanishad, I mean the idea which is referred to in this Upanishadic text. There are many who are very particular, very, 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 they are very strict in, very punctual in the, in following uh, disciplines. The exact time they go to temple, exact number of times, they, for half an hour or one hour they meditate. And they are very particular, very punctual. But at all other times, their life is entirely different. Those who follow even this mechanical ritualism with sincere devotion will gradually evolve to the next stage. That's true. But very often, this doesn't happen because those who follow the, the pursuit of mechanical piety follow this path without any devotion. They think the punctuality and mechanical practice is the end of spiritual life. Then there is a second stage. At the second stage, they, this school uh, is called in Sanskrit called Jnana Karma Samuchaya Vataha, means those who believe in, the, in combining knowledge and, and rituals. The first school, they, it's called Mimamsagas, there were a number of philosophers, those who know, Kumari Labhatta and Prabhagara. There were two great Mimamsa philosophers. Of course, the original teacher was Jaimini. In the second category, there were three great philosophers. They are Brahmadatta, Bhartu Prapancha, and uh, Mantena. These are three great thinkers. They, they, belong, they belong to the school of the synthesis of rituals and meditation. They believe that one should continue rituals to the end of one's life. But one should also practice a degree of meditation on the nature of different gods and goddesses. The third school is Advaita. As you should know, Advaitins believe that the ultimate reality is beyond rituals, it is beyond doctrines, it is beyond reasoning, and it is beyond all that we can think of at the empirical level. It is one's own real experience. It is beyond reasoning, but it doesn't contradict reason. It's beyond doctrines, but it doesn't contradict doctrines. This is the speciality of Advaita philosophy. This we have to keep in mind. Now we will come to the 10th verse. <coughs> the 10th verse tells us that the result of Vidya is different from the result of avidya. This is what the ancient sages have taught us. The 11th verse tells us that to be really effective, one should combine, make practice of rituals and meditation. Because meditation enables us to practice these rituals with real devotion. And if external rituals are performed with sincere devotion, it can take us beyond rituals. If we don't perform external rituals with devotion, it will keep us confined to the level of rituals. If rituals are combined with meditation then and devotion, then rituals can take us beyond rituals. This is the idea. So the 11th verse is a reconciliation between external practices and internal meditation. Now, next, see 11th. Vidyamcha avidyamcha yastad veda ubhayam saha avidyaya mrtyam tirtva vidyaya amrta masnuti So, those who follow the path of avidya, I mean those who follow the path of rituals, and those who follow the path of vidya, the path of meditation, I mean sincere devotion, if they, those who succeed in combining or reconciling or synthesizing action and meditation, they are able to 
graduates or evolves the next stage of spiritual life because if actions are performed without desire we can go beyond action if actions are performed with desire we are bound to the level of action and we can go beyond desire we can break the chain of desire only if we meditate on the results of action so we can act at the same time we can work at the same time within us we have the strong conviction the results of actions are limited if we can have if we can combine action and actionlessness then we can enjoy the fruits of action at the same time we will not become the victims of action because if actions are performed if all our activities are performed with desire we become victims of action because this desire is a chain that binds us to action and this chain makes us worry makes us anxious makes us depressed depending upon the results of action so that bec- that reduces life into a melancholic existence but at the same time if we can combine action with a strong conviction the results that the results of action are limited our goal is to go beyond action not against action vedanta never tells us to run away from action vedanta only tells us to face action more intelligently so that we will not become victims of action we will not we will not be enslaved by action and so long as we do our act we perform our activities with strong desire we are bound by action because we are bound by desire so if we can combine action with desirelessness we can go beyond action and this idea of desirelessness comes to our mind when we meditate when we combine meditation with action meditation on the higher reality meditation on the higher reality gives us an introspective mind and this introspective mind acts as a as a as a protection whenever uh, the actions do not produce the expected result man becomes depressed and at time of doing action we become anxious as to what will happen what will be the results of action and that's why all the problems most of the psychological problems in modern industrial world are associated with workaholism every day every moment when we open our eyes when we use our mind and ears we when we read newspapers when we observe what is happening around the world we can see the problems of action problems of action performed with desire performed with Uh, with a strong uh, result oriented uh, mind everything or most of the problems associated with psychological problem many of the physical problems are also high hypertension neurotic problems and even diabetics also is aggravated by anxiety all these problems are associated with desire and desire is a chain which turns action into into a binding force if action can be performed without desire then we can act at the same time we can remain a witness of our own action everything is going around but i am the one which is beyond all this i am the atman the infinite reality capital letter r which is not bound by any of these things which is the infinite reality which is the all pervasive omniscient atman and its very nature is infinite bliss infinite existence infinite knowledge and infinite bliss it is not bound by anything it is infinitude itself that's my true nature this meditation may not be always possible but at least at the very beginning one can meditate on the limitations of the actions 
it doesn't mean that one should withdraw from action withdrawal from action is not prescribed or recommended in any of the vedantic text as i said earlier there is a great this is very serious a very grave misunderstanding vedanta is the science of flight from the world of realities vedanta tells you that uh one the, the world is mithya the world is real so let us run away from the world vedanta tells you that the world is mithya mithya means relative mithya doesn't mean non existent mithya always means like maya it is relative and everyone knows any modern scientist any student of any elementary student of science can today tell you that the world the world that, that we see around cannot be eternal that's what vedanta says so it's a long back now if we can live in this world work in this world at the same time remember within us that the world in, in which we live of which we are a part which we experience every day is just a relative entity that will have a soothing effect on the mind we can work hard at the same time we can be free from the problems of work this is what the upanishad tells so the 11th verse tells us vidyam cha avidyam cha yastat veda ubhayam saha so i shall just give the prose order yaha vidyam cha avidyam cha tat ubhayam saha veda the one who knows both action and also meditation saha अविद्या मृत्यु तीर्त विद्या अमृतम अस्नुते अविद्या मृत्यु अविद्या मींस रिचुअल्स ही ही ट्रांसेंस डेथ डेथ हियर मींस ही ट्रांसेंस द लिमिटेशंस ऑफ मटेरियल लाइफ बाय एक्शन बिकॉज़ if one remains actionlessness without meditation only then he is lost to this world and also the next world if one if one works hard by living in this world one can transcend limitation of worldliness that is what is meant by going beyond worldly death at the same time it will gradually take us to the immortal reality that is the implication of this verse we so that's why swami vivekananda puts in a very very emphatic language he says the world is a gymnasium for us to work out our karmas it doesn't mean that swami ji departs or deviates from the teachings of shankaracharya what shankara taught in 8th century swami ji taught in 19th century but the time in which shankara lived and taught was entirely different at the time in which swami ji lived and thought shankara said brahma satyam jagat mithya jeevo brahma eva na par big that is that was the doctrine required for that age swami ji also agreed that world is mithya it's a relative but in 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 you know, run away from this world you can use this world you make use of this world a gymnasium we don't live in this gymnasium we go to gymnasium you may do some exercise for your health for building of muscles but you that but you don't consider the nation as an eternal reality it is a place where you work you go and work out and come back so swami ji says the world is a gymnasium for us to work out our karmas that's what swami ji says in a very graphic emphatic statement swami ji says world is relative you need not run away from it live in this world and make use of this world that will help us to live in this world without being worldly minded the world will not enter our mind we can live on the world and both sri ramakrishna says when you when you cross a river the boat should remain on top of water water should not be within the boat boat should be on water similarly if when if we live in this world without being part of this world we can live intelligently and that's what is meant by reconciliation or synthesis a blending together of action or rituals 
and meditation. And that is the theme of this 11th verse. So, we will deal with this subject in the next class. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti